Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. It's G3 launch day and I had a chance to play with it a lot. So let's go ahead and check out that footage, shall we? All right, here we have it, the LG G3. Now the first thing that I want to say is that I want one and yes, I'm going to be reviewing it. No questions asked about that. I see that this device is available May 28th for some countries, otherwise it's going to be more widely available this summer. Same thing with the United States, it's just going to depend on the carrier. But just for an example, Clove UK has the device for pre-order, it will start shipping July 1st. As for pricing, expect it to be somewhere around $700. So this device comes in several different colors, we've only got three of them here, gold, white, and also black. As for the look and feel of the device, it is all plastic. It is not metal in any way, although I do like it. It doesn't feel cheap. It's got a nice weight to it. In hand, it really does feel nice. I love that curve of the back cover. So yes, that back cover is plastic. It is removable, but it does have this nice aluminum finish look to it, and it has a nice matte texture as well. So it doesn't leave fingerprints. It doesn't leave smudges. And that's something that I am very appreciative of because I have quite oily fingers. So here we have the G3 next to the Galaxy Note 3, and you can see that the Note 3 is just a little bit bigger. It's a little longer. As for the thickness, it might be a little bit deceiving because of that curved back of the G3, but it looks to be about the same thickness. Now comparing it to the Galaxy S5, in terms of size, it's somewhere between the Galaxy S5 and the Galaxy Note 3, although you can really see the difference in the size of displays here. 5.1 versus 5.5 really does make a difference. Now this is where I am amazed with the screen ratio to the body size. Here we have the M8, which is quite tall, only 5 inches for the display, versus 5.5, and we still have a really nice footprint, a really nice size, so I am quite impressed here. Then of course, I just have to do it, where's my 5S? So, with the 5S, you can really see the size difference here. I know Apple with their iPhone 6 is going to be stepping up display size. But geez, where have we gone with Android? They're all so big now. I really don't want these getting any bigger. Even next to the Z2, which has a pretty big footprint, 5.2 inches is a lot smaller than 5.5, and it really does show here. I really don't think we're going to be leaving anyone desiring more with the screen size on this puppy. Now, due to popular demand, I have the device pile up with the iPhone 5S, the Galaxy S5, the G3 and the Note 3 underneath, so you can really see how those add up in terms of size. It's really kind of right in between the two big guys. And then we have the 5S as kind of the humorous outlier. So taking a bit of a look around the phone, starting with the top, we've got a receiver, we've got an ambient light sensor and proximity sensor, a 2.1 megapixel front facing camera, and what looks to be like a notification LED. So yes, we know that the device is entirely plastic, but if you look at the bottom, what's interesting is that there seems to be a spun aluminum plate underneath the glass, which gives it a really nice accent, and it seems to be a different pattern depending on the color of the device. Now at the top, we have an IR blaster and an antenna for the Korean model. They get to watch TV on their phone. Very, very lucky. We've also got a microphone on the top. Now along the sides, they are both entirely bare. It looks very clean and refined. Now along the bottom, we have a standard headphone jack. We've also got a microphone and we have a USB 2.0 port. Now we've also got the speaker along the bottom and this is where I want to pause it for a second right here. Now compared to some of the other devices coming out right now, I'm a little bit disappointed that we have a speaker on the back like this. I do wish that we had, you know, front facing stereo speakers, although at least it's loud. It doesn't sound tinny to me. It actually is quite a good speaker. So that's some people have been asking me that. So I can say that I'm pleased with the quality, but I'm not so happy of the placement. Now we've got a 3000 milliamp hour battery. It's removable. And what they're saying about the display is that it's quite efficient. So I'm really hoping to get that great battery life that we have on the G2, despite the pixel density of this display and also the size of it. But that's yet to be tested. That's something that I'm going to have to get back to you on once I get my hands on this device. 
Now on the top right here, we've got that 13 megapixel camera with optical image stabilization and also software stabilization added. I will show you some samples of that. Then we've got a dual LED flash with two different colors. And we've also got that laser that helps with focus. Next, we've got that volume rocker. It feels really nice. They changed the appearance of it a bit. It's nice and tactile. We've also got that power button on the back as well. It's something that I really grew to love. And yes, what everyone loves, we've got a micro SD card slot for expansion. Then underneath the battery, you can see we've got a micro SIM card slot. Now moving on to that display. Yes, that display. The pixel density is just so dense that you can no longer see the pixel matrix. So because you can no longer see the pixel matrix of this display, everything looks printed. Everything just looks like it's popping right at your face. You are only paying attention to the content now because you can no longer see those pixels. So it really is something. And if you're going to be watching content, I think that it's quite worth it. Now, as far as the viewing angles of this display, I'm quite pleased when you tilt it, you're not losing brightness on the display. Also, the colors are not shifting. The only thing that I notice is that you can see that there's a bit of light bleed when you're looking at darker content, but it's really not so bad. I'm quite pleased overall with the viewing angles. So now we are looking at a pure white image on both the Z2 and also on the G3. Now what I'm happy to say is that the G3 is not overly bluish. That makes me very happy. The Z2, I have the ability to change the white balance. That's a cool setting that it has. And I was able to make it more warm. And I can see that the G3 is not bluish anymore, although it's a little bit greenish. I did get hold of another one and the color temperature was even better. So I am very happy that that the G3 is not bluish like the G2 and like LG's other phones. A lot of their other phones are very, very blue. So I'm happy that that's one thing I'm not seeing anymore. Now looking at an image of a CIE diagram, that's the iPhone 5S and here's the G3. You can see quite a difference in what's going on with the colors between these two displays. Now looking at the G3, you can see that we've got this odd triangle appearing here. It feels as if they've tried to give the colors more punch, but it just doesn't look right. I need to get my hands on one of these and see what's really going on with the calibration, but I have seen nicer colors from a display and honestly, I'm kind of disappointed. So now we're going to take a look at the difference between Quad HD. I can actually do that with my camera, zoom in very far. This is the G3 right here. And then I also have the Z2, which is 1080 by 1920. This is the Z2. Then back to the G3, then to the Z2, then the G3. So you can see quite a difference between them. So we've been told that you can't tell the difference after 300 pixels per inch, but yes, you can, and it's quite impressive. I would call it the difference between home quality print and professional printed glossy photo. It really does make a difference. So when first setting up the phone, we are presented with Smart Notice and the settings for Smart Notice. Smart Notice is LG's own personal assistance program, kind of working like Google Now. Just say that you miss a phone call. It's going to remind you that you need to call that person back so that you don't forget. It will also ask you if you want to add a contact if it senses that you don't have that contact yet in your address book. It'll offer you tips based on the weather. So if it senses it's going to rain, it will tell you to bring an umbrella and also offers tips based on the phone status. So if you're running low on internal storage, it will ask you if you want to clear some. It seems like a really nice feature and I can't wait to play around with it more to see what else it offers. But these are some of the most basic things. Also, when scrolling through the interface, we are presented with LG Health, which is kind of like S Health on Samsung. I'm sure LG has its own implemented thing. The Life Band supports this, and I'm really hoping it supports the G Watch too. But as it stands in real time, this app should track all your exercise in a 24 hour cycle. It's really nice to see health services added into all of these mainstream phones. Now, continuing to look through the interface, the very first thing that I noticed is that the colors are very toned down on a lot of the icons and the colors really mesh well. I realized that on the G2 it really bothered me because some of the colors were really loud. Some things looked neon and I wasn't so happy with it. It just kind of made my eyes bleed, to be honest, but I think they did a good job. I think things are toned down. They've now got the circular motif and I think it looks quite nice. 
We've still got access to our QSlide apps inside of notification panel. That hasn't changed. And I think that the QSlide apps look exactly the same as well. If that annoys you for any reason, you're free to simply just uncheck it from being underneath the shortcut settings and it will be gone. Of course, the coolest setting is probably the lock screen setting that I saw brought over from the G Pro 2. As far as security goes, I think that knock code actually works pretty well. They say there's over 80,000 different tap combinations that you can make with these four quadrants. And it's awesome because if the screen is off, all you have to do is put your pattern in and you've just turned on your screen and unlocked your phone without doing anything other but tapping on the display. So it works very well and it's very convenient. My one wish would be for them to somehow implement the ability to use a certain tap combination from screen off to be able to open up certain applications. The next thing that LG created is called the smart keyboard, although I found it a little bit difficult to type on, so I don't really know how smart it actually is. So just say that I am typing and I accidentally typed thus instead of this. I can reach my thumb up and touch on this, but the idea is to keep your thumb on the keyboard and simply swipe upward. And when you do that, it corrects it for you. Now this is cool, but I think it requires a bit of a learning curve and I don't think it's going to be any faster than simply just reaching my thumb up and tapping on the word this. Also, a feature is flat useless if the word that's needed, like is, doesn't actually even show up. LG really needs to work on autocorrection. And also there is this feature that allows you to type a line and if you see an error in that line, you can hold your finger down on the spacebar. When you hold your finger down on the spacebar, you can use that to scroll back and forth to try to get to that word that you have wrong. But as you can see, it's a little tedious and you can't scroll all the way to the very front of a line. You actually have to lift up your thumb and once you lift your thumb, you have to place your thumb down again and get the cursor to show up again. I find it much easier just to hit the delete button or simply to touch the line itself. So for about five seconds, I thought, wow, cool concept. And then I was like, I would never use this. Where's Swift Key? And by the way, I can easily change the height of the Swift Key keyboard as well. Now checking out some other features of the interface, if you hold down on the home button, you see that you are presented with Google Now, QMemo, and also QVoice. We also have some other features, such as if you touch on the task switcher button, you can see that there's clear all and also dual window. Dual window is LG's answer to multitasking. So you choose from pre-approved apps and drag them into either window, top or bottom. So if you tap this blue tab here, it resizes the windows. You can drag it around. If you tap on it, it brings up a couple of options. So clicking on this one here changes the arrangement of the windows. This one allows you to access apps again. Then you are free to pick a different app and drag it into either window that you'd like. This button lets us get rid of the dominant window if you don't need the secondary window anymore. They have also included another way to get to dual window. You just need to hold down on the back button and it executes it as well. Holding down on the home button accesses Google Now. And if you hold down the task switcher button, it brings up the menu. So all of these on-screen buttons have dual uses. Now, I so badly wanted to get into some gameplay. We have the Adreno 330 GPU on here. This is also the Snapdragon 801 AC version of the Snapdragon 801. Now, I realize that this display is very pixel dense. Now, I do have the Tab Pro 8.4 that's also a Quad HD display. And what I can tell you is that the gameplay really does not seem to be affected in my particular experience. While playing Granny Smith, I don't see any choke ups. I don't see any issues really at all. So far, everything looks pretty smooth and I'm decently happy here. We're gonna have to see what goes on in terms of throttling and what LG does in terms of governing, but I'm pretty convinced. I don't think we're gonna have too much of an issue, but I really can't wait until we have Quad HD displays with a Snapdragon 805 or even 810 SOCs. It's just gonna be amazing. I'm sure that the performance will be even better. Now I had a chance to play around with the cameras. I see a lot of features that were carried over from the G Pro 2. One of them, which is if you touch the flash button on the front facing camera, there is no light to create a flash. But if you press on the flash button, it's going to make the viewfinder window smaller and it's going to have a very bright window around it. That way you have more light going towards your face and it acts essentially as a flash. 
You can see the difference in my terrible taken selfies here. This one's quite a bit brighter and this one is, well, it's darker. Another awesome feature is the selfie ability. Essentially, you hold it towards yourself. You hold your hand upward. It recognizes your hand. And when you close your palm in three seconds, it takes a picture. So that is so simple and it works very, very well. Now, some comments about this front facing camera. I really do wish that it was a little bit higher resolution, such as having a five megapixel camera on a camera that they're advertising as a selfie camera would have been a very smart move. Also, I noticed that the colors are just not so good, really not so good at all. There really isn't much color at all and skin just doesn't look very human like and you would think that they would get this right on such a thing. We're gonna have to see what it looks like once it's finalized and in better lighting, but I just wasn't so impressed, honestly. Now I had a chance to look at the camera interface and I do like it. I think they cleaned it up quite a bit. I like that you can adjust video and picture settings at the exact same time, which led me to see that you actually can use HDR and video as well. Of course, we've got that UHD feature or 4K quote unquote. And I did take some sample videos of both UHD and also 1080p while messing around with optical image stabilization. So I want to show you some of those. I feel like the video is quite a bit more grainy. Ooh, this is actually 1080p now. Before it was on 4K. Back and forth. Checking out that optical image stabilization. Move it up and down. Check that out. Moving it. Now here we have the Galaxy S5. We're gonna wobble it pretty much the same way that I was doing on the G3. You can see it really makes quite a big difference when you have that optical image stabilization. So now I am aiming the camera at myself, doing a bit of a video test. Just wanted to see if it will autofocus on me. <laughs> uh, one of the issues that I saw with the G2 is that it did not find my face. It would take quite some time to focus. I'm hoping that the optics have, in have improved and the processing as well. I can see that laser kind of kind of pointing at me. Hello. No, if I was to be walking, that would be something interesting. Can it stay focused on my face while I'm walking and I'm wobbling and I'm doing all kinds of silly, crazy things? All right. I don't know what people would do at a game filming themselves. Look at this! Look at this! No, you get the point. So video stabilization is on on the Galaxy S5, and I want to do kind of that same test. Got it backward, seeing just how it's able to keep me steady, or not. Alright, give it a fair go, it's about the same thing. Now moving on, we've also got the magic photo mode, which I have an example of from another video which I will input. We've got panorama and also dual camera. So here we have a feature that's called Magic Focus underneath the camera. So basically it takes several different exposures and you can choose after you've taken your image what part you want to stay in focus. So for example, let's go backward and let's focus on this tin soldier here. You can see he's in focus now. I'm going to hit snap. It's going to take several pictures in succession. You need to make sure to keep this very, very still because if there was anyone moving in the background, you can end up seeing the ghosting of them moving. But now, if I want to refocus the image, I tap here. It's going to say processing. It essentially composes all those photos together. And then I can tap on whatever I'd like to be in focus in the image. The downside, though, is that you can't save all of the images in real time and then just refocus at will. You end up 
having to just pick one, hit save, and if you want to do the same type of photo again, you need to do the entire thing again. So that's a bit unfortunate. I wish you could save your example in real time so you could pick at any moment what you want in focus. You can mess with infinity, back to macro focus, and if I'm satisfied with what's going on here, I can hit save. I'd like to, I can just hit all in focus and everything becomes in focus, like a deep cinematic focus. So I think that this is a really nice feature. The only thing like I mentioned is that you need to make sure that everything in the shot is completely stable and not moving, or you end up having some type of a motion blur that looks very odd. Now for still images, LG claims that with their new laser autofocus that this is the end of blurry photos especially when looking at the end user who simply just wants to point and shoot. Now it's true, I have been able to take some pretty nonsense, very quick photos, and a lot of them were in focus. But what I notice is that if you get careless and you are simply tapping the screen, you can get pretty blurry photos as well, because if you tap the screen, you're gonna cause motion blur. So I really don't want people to get careless in this situation. You really do need to keep your hand stable when you tap very lightly. Now in an interesting demo, we had the G3 next to the Galaxy S5 and they were demonstrating how their laser autofocus is faster than phase detection such as on the Galaxy S5 and actually yes, it is a bit faster and you can see that right there. And you can see it again, and you can see it again, and just for good measure you can see the same thing again, and just one more time. So this is pretty cool, the point being that you have a laser that's shooting out at an object, it bounces back at the camera, and it's able to see, oh yeah, a laser hit a certain point, so I'm going to focus on that point that that light reached. But my curiosity would be, what happens if you go out in daylight, in straight daylight, which one is going to be faster? I can see that they cleverly have it set up as low lighting, given the advantage that the laser autofocus works a little bit better in low lighting. Now, if you're in a situation where laser autofocus will fail, they also have contrast detection autofocus. In all fairness, phase detection autofocus is faster than contrast detection autofocus, so I want to see a more fair test. In some circumstances, the S5 might be faster. But if you are taking pictures in a less than optimal lighting setting, such as indoors, at a party, or whatever with your friends, I can see how this could work really well. Now I've had a chance to show you some of the functionality of this camera, but I can't wait to get my hands on one so I can take it out and about and show you image quality as well, so hang tight for that. Now looking at the quick circle case, it's pretty cool because it doesn't affect the wireless charging that's already built into the device. And from what I'm told, developers will be able to develop for the case as well soon. So we've got many quick icons underneath the menu, LG Health, Music, we've got Camera, Messaging, you also can answer phone calls, look at call log, you've got access to settings, so you can change your watch faces or your clock faces. A nifty thing is being able to take a picture without even having to open up the case. You also have a back button so you can easily get back to the menu. You can scroll through all your songs and playlists. It is really nice that now all we need is just a case. You don't need a separate back cover that clicks on in order to take advantage of the inductive charging. It just works. I'm also liking that the charger allows your device to sit upward instead of laying down. There are a lot of nice colors here and I'm very excited about this product. I can't wait to get my hands on all of this stuff here. Despite some of the downfalls like not being water resistant and not having front facing stereo speakers, I don't care overall. I want this thing.